Good evening. For those uh, with us tonight, welcome. We're pre-recording because of the projected blizzard on Sunday. So if we don't get it, we're just going to delete this and, and we will just have a live service. Um, I hope you enjoy the snow and you make some fun memories together. I want us to be praying for Samia Andreos. Um, her results came back. She has ovarian cancer, stage three. And we want to keep her in our prayers and all the other dear saints that are battling cancer long term here at Southside. I got a text from Ray, and he told me that Sammy has been learning and coming to, coming to her with such clarity that she has been set apart for sickness, her calling in life and death, and she has surrendered to him. And this sweet lady is giving God so much glory in the middle of all this. We thank God uh, for her and the God that's holding her. So let's be uh, her support and her prayers, and we're going to help our sweet sister uh, during this time and brother. Well, this evening or morning, we're going to take back up in the book of Romans, where we find ourselves upon one of those benchmark verses. It's just pregnant with meaning. If you'll open your Bibles into Romans chapter 6, we could really spend the rest of our lives trying to open up this verse and get our arms around it. And so I'm going to go out on a limb and on, if Laura, if you're listening on Sunday, put this on my tombstone, baby. Uh, this is foundational for every child of God. And so we have so much to cover. I just want to dig in and ask God for grace to understand the verse that's before us uh, this, this day. So I'm going to keep saying this day, whether it's morning or night. So work with me, okay? This is awkward. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I do lift up my sister. I pray that you will be with her in a very special way during this journey. I thank you for the way you've been meeting her and upholding her. God, I thank you for all of our friends at this church who are battling cancer right now. God, what a, what a long-term battle. Kirk and Sherry, some of the ones I know who have been battling for so long, and I just pray, give them grace and give them strength. Give them encouragement. Fill them with their blessed hope. And now, Lord, I pray that as we as a church open up this word, I'm asking that your spirit, Holy Spirit, come and illuminate this verse to our hearts. Let us understand with our minds and receive with our hearts and be changed and transformed by the promise that is in this verse. God, open it up. Unfold it to our hearts. I want us to know this. I want us to have epinosis for this beautiful truth of the grace of God. So we ask you to meet us here this day. Amen. Well, we have been working through Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, and we're going to finish it today. And this has been an amazing section. We just hit gold, didn't we, in Romans 6. Well, here's the outline that we've been working through. Paul has given us five truths concerning our release from the dominion of sin. In verse 1, we saw an antagonist who came forth, shall we just sin that grace might abound? Paul answers with an axiom, how can you who died to sin still live in it? And then he flushes that out with an argument in verses 3 through 10. We took three weeks on it. It was all indicatives. They're things that God has done and that you're to know. Knowing that, that when you were, had faith, you were joined to Jesus. And when, when he died, you died. When he was buried, you were buried. When he was raised to walk in newness of life. So we are raised to walk in newness of life of life. Then we looked at what should be our attitude, and our attitude should be reckon this to be true. I'm dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Take it from your head to your heart. This is, you're not making it happen. God has done it, but you reckon what God has done, and we live into the fullness of what God has done. And then we began looking at our application. And in verses 12 through 14, we saw that sin no longer is reigning over you, and you're to no longer give your members to serve sin any longer. <clears throat> and now tonight, we're going to look at verse 14, finishing up our application. 
And so there is a battle in Romans 6, 12 through 13 with remaining sin. And it is so constant and fierce that I get why Paul said, you got to put on the full armor of God daily. We need it in this battle. And so I stand with the hymn writer who says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. All all hell is set against us on our way to glory. And so the question is, how am I going to make it with a world, a devil and his demons and and, and just our own flesh? How how are we going to make it? My body is weak and my resolve wavers at times. My mind is tired from 2020. The opposition against Christianity is growing fast in our land. The days are evil. And so my question to you is, do we have any hope? Are you feeling hopeless tonight in your battle against sin or this morning? And this is my prayer. I've been praying. I'm praying for you. If you're in that place, I've got such good news for you tonight. I pray that it will refresh and restore your joy and your battle and your hope. So brethren, I've got the most amazing answer for you tonight the best pillow to put your head on, a spiritual sleep number so you can rest. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but you are under grace. And so I want you to hear this after all these imperatives that we've been looking at for the last few weeks. These these imperatives to not let sin reign and don't offer up your members to serve sin. This now is an indicative in verse 14. This is a statement of fact that no matter how fierce the war is, no matter how many battles we have lost, how much ground we've given up through laziness, sloth, drifting, preferring sin over God, Sin will not have dominion over you. It will not win. It will not take you back to your old state of being an Adam and being under the law and its consequences. Grace will bring you out and grace will bring you home. I've watched it again and again and again. He will finish what he began. He never gets thwarted. And you have been joined to the good shepherd and his sheep will be brought home where I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The beauty and empowerment that is before us this morning, weary saint, let this be honey to your soul. Sin will not win. We need to pray again. Father, I come before you with this amazing promise and I'm asking that you will use it. You will bring it into every mind and heart now, and you will restore and refresh us from battle-worn saints. Encourage every heart that will hear this message. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans 6, 14. For. I just can't get past this word, for. For is an explanatory word. It's not a standalone sentence but it's given us an explanation to the verses before it. You read verse 12. uh, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. In all honesty, without grace, I don't stand a chance of that not happening. You can command it till the cows come home, but it ain't going to happen. My strength isn't going to keep that from happening. But this for... Let's hope and joy and certainty come into verses 12 through 13. This is what I'm going to call divine assurance that we will prevail in our battle against sin ultimately. And the joy of my heart is that it's not a command. Hear that. It's an indicative. This is a divine indicative of a reality that guarantees this statement. It's undergirded by God himself. We will have triumph over sin. Or another way to say it is we're going to win this battle. Don't you love going into a battle that you're guaranteed to win? Those are my favorite battles. You fight in a whole different way. You enter into it. This verse is what I needed. And I pray for you as well that this is what you needed 
in your Christian walk. This has just been water to a man in the desert this week. So let me give you your outline of this verse. So you got your big outline that we've been working through, and here's your little small outline for just verse 14. In verse 14, Paul gives us two truths for why the believer will triumph over sin. And my first point is it's promised. And my second point is it's guaranteed. Promised. <laughs> for sin shall not be master over you. What do we mean by master over you? The context, Paul's made it very, very clear what it means. There's no room for missing this one. There's no room for doubt or difference. In Romans 5, 12 through 21, we learn two Adams. When the first Adam sinned, he took all of humanity with him, and we have the guilt and the original sin of Adam, and now sin is ruling and reigning. In Romans 6, 1 through 10, you died to sin. The old man has died. 6.11, reckon yourselves that you're dead to sin and alive to God. And in 6.12, fight so that sin will not reign again. So master over you was that old station in Adam when you were under the law and its curse and its condemnation. It's when you were ruled and you were controlled by sin. It was all we lived for and all that we desired. It was a, a true bondage in Romans 3, 9. You were under its dominion. And so Romans 6 has told us that dominion has been broken, but it has not been annihilated. It remains there are insurgents that are fighting us this day. It wants its old station. It wants its old control, and it wants to rule again. And we're to fight it. And Romans 8 is we're going to learn how to do that in the spirit. Romans 6 is not the whole story on sanctification. I just want to say that. I have some of you who are really uptight that I haven't covered every aspect of sanctification yet. I just want you to know we will, but I can't do it all in one sermon. So just keep journeying with me. We will get to that. The battle, though, is so real and intense. Before I was saved, I didn't even know what the battle was. I just served it. I had no battle with sin. It just told me what to do, and I served it. And now it's so tiresome and constant. It's like three steps forward and two back. And during the two back, I get so discouraged in my walk. And as I watch others in this season, especially retreat and quit, it scares me. Because to lose this battle is to lose all. The wages of sin is death. There's never been a more important war World War I, World War II, the Civil War, this is one that I cannot lose. Child of God, struggling and downcast, or if you're seeing great victory, we have both in the church right now. The promise is given to us this day. Sin shall not be master over you. I want you to hear that. It will not win. It can't bring you back under condemnation. The devil's going to tell you every day that it can. It can't. It can't bring you back under its dominion. It can't keep you from glory. It cannot happen. The indicative is to encourage our conduct through reality. There's a reality that it cannot happen. You might stumble or fall or be ambushed. Some of you are so scarred and battle bruised, blood, sweat, and tears. But sin will not be master over you. You will not lose this war. The great theologian Charles Hodge said, it is not a hopeless struggle, but a certainty of victory. Isn't that good news after verses 12 through 13? It's a certainty of victory. But how? I feel so weak. Exactly. What is the ground of such a promise? I don't need another false promise in my life. And I want you to see our second point. The triumph over sin is guaranteed. Four, you are not under law, but you're under grace. Four is why won't sin be master over you? <clears throat> and Paul is now going to give you an explanation as to why. And again, this is not a command, but a reality this is what is true, I want you to hear this, of every child of God, not just the really spiritual or the really gifted. 
It says, for, oh, for you, for you, it's everyone who has faith in Jesus Christ. No matter how great or how small that faith is, it's for you, this promise. And it's a little bit like justification. You can't be any more justified uh, or more or less. You're, you're, you're joined to the person and work of Jesus and we're all perfectly justified. And so in the same way, all of us have this promise that sin will not have dominion over you. So this is a fight that comes out of rest. And I preach this a lot, but it, it, it comes out of rest that by grace, man, I'm right with God, I'm accepted. I have his power, I have his promise that sin won't have dominion. So I'm resting in Christ while I'm fighting this battle that we've been looking at in the last few months. So I want you to hear this. Our victory over sin is guaranteed by God's grace and by God's grace alone. Aren't you glad it's not an imperative? There would be no hope. Your hard work and battle is not your hope. The last two weeks, we looked at the hard work of not offering up your members to sin. Um, it, it, it is not your hope, your hard work. It's just your duty and your privilege as a child of God. But the reason that I will get to the shores of Jordan is by the grace of God and the grace of God alone. And so what I want to do is open up the most jam-packed statement in the whole Bible. If you had a zip drive of all of Paul's learning, here it is, boom. But first, we, we need to make some observations from our text. And I know how much you guys love observations, but I want you to know this. I've had people email me and say they love my long introductions, and they, they love my observations of the text, okay? So there, there's a couple of people that like it. The rest of you just keep journeying with me. So this statement is in a context, a flow, an argument, a point. To, to just pull this verse out and look at the words would do a great injustice to what Paul is laying out here, and I was shocked how many people do that very thing. So I want to begin with staying in the text and trying to get our arms around what is this magnificent, beautiful promise that Paul's given to us. So my first observation is, is context. Context. What is the context? <laughs> is Paul's argument about justification or sanctification in this passage? What is Paul's argument as he drops this beautiful, pregnant phrase into the flow of his thought? There's a reason for why he says this. And it's not to take it out of the argument and flow and to talk all about everything we know about law and grace and just fill it out. Specifically, only to justification. Which I just want you to know, we spent a year focusing on the first five chapters of our justification and how God has worked and made us right with him and justified us. We are law and grace experts on justification right now as a church, I pray. And we get that. And we've learned it, right? So context, this is the power of sin and how to live a life pleasing to God as a justified child of God. And so this is not dealing with, with right here the penalty of sin, but this is dealing with the power of sin, and the newness of life that we as believers walk in being raised with Jesus. And so how do we do that? By being under grace. Second observation is a lexical observation, which is a word study. Paul uses the word two times in this verse, under. This phraseology, <coughs> excuse me, means to be under something, to be in its realm, to be in its jurisdiction, to be in its rule or reign, to be under its authority. Again, it was used in Romans 3, 9, that all are under sin. So I want you to hear this. We are not under law. We're not under its jurisdiction anymore. We're not under its rule. We're not under its realm. We're not even under its requirements. But rather, we are under grace. We're under a new rule, a new realm, a new jurisdiction. And that's going to be an important observation as we journey tonight or this morning. Rather, we are under grace. And I want to look at a syntactical observation of this passage, is you are not under this, but you are under this. You're not under law, but you're under grace. 
And there's a strong contrast being made here. You're not under law, but you're under grace. And I want you to see the way he's phrased it is they're mutually exclusive. You can't be under both and you can't be under partial. I want you to get that. It's one or the other in this passage. You can't have one. With it. It's just, I'm either under law or I'm under grace. That's how Paul has written this in the Greek. What is more, you are born under law. And you must be born again to be born to grace. The way we come under grace is by being born again and believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So here's Paul's argument then. How am I going to be victorious against sin as a believer? How will it not regain mastery over me when I'm just so weak? That's what everyone is asking. I, that's 99% of my counseling. The answer, because you're not under law, but you're under grace. And this would be the whole mosaic system when we say law. It was that law that was handed down to Israel, to, to Moses. And I don't want to get too lost here because we've dealt with this for so long in Romans 1 through 5. But I'm going to just review just a hair. I feel it's important as we look at this this morning. The Mosaic Covenant <coughs> said, do this and live. Disobey and die. And it demanded a perfect righteousness. It demanded a full obedience. And the law was given and it revealed the righteous character of God. But here's what the law we've been learning is it couldn't cure sin. It couldn't fix our condemnation. You could obey it till the cows come home, but you're guilty and you're condemned. And so the law couldn't fix that. And the law could not break the power of sin. Do not steal. It can't break a heart that loves to steal and covets. So the law could not fix the power of sin. The law could reveal the righteous character of God and what he requires for us. The law can condemn you. The soul that sins must die. And the law can tutor you to show you that you need a savior. Shows you that you're guilty and you're condemned. And I need to flee to Jesus Christ. Let me read back to Romans 3.19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and the whole world might become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will ever be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. It shows you your sinfulness. It was never intended to justify you. I want you to get that. But now, in Romans 3.21 I want you to see now, but now in verse 14, you are under grace. And there's just these three little words in this verse that should mean everything to you. And I could spend the rest of the year preaching on these three words and never show you the fullness of them, the hope giving joy, peace, and certainty of them. What these words have come to mean to the one who has died under the law and come to Christ, you are under the jurisdiction of grace. Christian, you're no longer under the law, but under grace. And what a difference this ruler is from that old slave master. And while just as demanding, God must have perfect obedience to be in his presence. He must punish all violations of his holy law we see that grace does for us what we could have never done for ourselves. And so God sent his son into the world. He was born under the law. Matthew 5, 17, he gave a perfect obedience to it. And he paid the debt for the soul that sinned under the law, the eternal debt that we all would have to pay in, in hell. And he paid that on the cross. And now by grace through faith, not works, that is imputed to your account. That's what we've been learning. God's law is satisfied and his wrath is appeased. And it's all done in Christ. And Paul's going to say in Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So I want you to hear this. I'm no longer under the law, but I'm under grace. And that's the heart of the gospel. We are no longer under the Mosaic law as a covenant with all of those 613 commandments. We're under the new covenant. 
And I'm just going to read um, from Hebrews to describe this new covenant, and then we'll finish up our passage. Hebrews 8, 6, listen to it. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, Jesus Christ, this new covenant, being under grace. By as much as Jesus, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, the law, there would have been no occasion sought for a second covenant. For finding fault with them, he says, God, behold, days are coming, says the Lord, well, I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. And I did not care for them, says the Lord. I don't care for them. They've disobeyed my law. And for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them upon their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's what it means to be under grace. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord for all in this covenant shall know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. And when he said a new covenant, he has made the first, the law under Moses, obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete is growing old and it's ready to disappear. It's ready to fade away. You're no longer under law. It served its purpose in history. And now we are under grace. And it's so beautiful but we haven't been faithful to our text yet, right? I hope you see that. How is Paul using then this powerful packed statement in Romans 6.14? And now as we unfold that, I want you to see there, there are a lot of views on this, but there's really two main views in conservative Christianity, what I would call reformed faith. And I would like to go over those with you and, and then send you home singing or go out in the snow and play and sing after this. Listen to Galatians chapter 3. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. Here's a promise through Abraham that I'm going to bless you by faith. And then the law is given with all these rules and commandments. Are they contrary? Perish the thought. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, if I gave it to impart life, then righteousness would have indeed been based on the law. But the scripture has shut up all men under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, this, this new covenant through Christ, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith. But now faith has come and we're no longer under a tutor. We are not under the law any longer. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you were baptized into Christ Jesus. Sound familiar to Romans 6? And you've clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor freeman. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring's heirs according to promise. And that's the most popular view of Romans 6.14 is that of justification. Everything about this view that I'm going to go over now is absolutely true. I just don't know if that's what Paul was getting at in this verse. So you got to put on your thinking cap and come wrestle with me. Here it is. <coughs> Law and grace are contrary principles in which I approach God. And so it's law is my legal obligation. Law is my seeking to gain favor with God by good law keeping. It's my legal obedience. And so it's looking at my law keeping to try to become righteous to stand before God. And, and this is saying you're not under that, right? You're no longer under that. And I would say, amen. Romans 1 through 5, you are no longer under that law trying to perform to get right with God, but you're under grace. And God has done the work, and I live believing in Christ and trusting Him and Him alone for my acceptance before God, which is so true. 
and the whole foundation of the Christian life. You cannot come out from under this truth. Amen? So all this is true, but is that what Paul is saying here? The other view, which I'm going to call Paul's view, I think I just gave myself a way as to which view I think it is. The biblical view is what I think. This is not talking about our acceptance with God. It's not the curse and the condemnation that's upon you. But this is dealing with how do I engage in this conflict with sin as a believer, a justified believer? How do I fight remaining sin? And if it isn't what I do, but what Christ has done from that first view, I am liberated by his great love to live for him. And that's what I preached for a year. That's so true is when you get justified, you're liberated, you're set free, and you can go live for God, not trying to earn his favor, but because you have his favor. But just think about that. What would that mean is that the certainty then of me prevailing in my battle against sin as a believer, it's all based on my assurance then of being forgiven. And many times in the battle, that is going to come under attack, Pilgrim's Progress. There's going to be times, so, so I, I, can't, I can't fight sin unless I have full assurance. So is the strength of my assurance, my hope, in this battle against sin, feeble and frail as that assurance can be? John Bunyan had his greatest victory against sin with no assurance sitting in a Bedford jail. So the conclusion with the popular view is to be under law means using it in a wrong way as the means of our salvation. It's legalistic, but that's not what Paul says here. So I don't think Paul's talking about our misuse of the law here, but rather our status to the law, our being under it. So we're, 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 we're no longer under it. So here's my conclusion. I think I've confused everybody thoroughly, but I think I'm going to make it clear now. If I don't, uh, we'll we'll re-record this later. Here's my conclusion as I've been led by some of the great commentators in our land and preachers. Law and grace is far broader here, under. It's Paul contrasting powers and realms and epics, and dispensations, and redemptive history. Under law is the Mosaic law. The seven times he uses it in in Romans under law in this letter, it was always the Mosaic law in that body and system. It was the old covenant. Okay? So Paul is saying we're no longer under that system. We're no longer under that covenant. We're no longer under that rule. We are under a new era the era of grace, the new covenant that was inaugurated in his blood. John 1.17 says the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Grace is the realm that we have been brought into. And the context is you're no longer in Adam, but you're in Christ. And you remember when we began this whole thing in Romans 5.2 is after being justified, now we stand in what? We stand in grace. We stand now for, as we begin this Christian life in the full favor of God and approval and acceptance and the power. You're joined to Jesus Christ to live in the rule and the resources of God. The law was powerless and it had no strength. It could define sin and expose it, but it gave you no strength. Here's what I think Paul's saying. Listen to Romans 8.1. Therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, it couldn't subdue sin. The law could not do that. So God did it. How? Sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh on that cross. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, 
but according to the Spirit. Being under law, it it couldn't subdue sin. It couldn't work. It was weak. It was helpless. And now being under grace, I have the power of the Holy Spirit now being under this to um, fulfill the law's requirements, to love God and love other people. To be under law was to be under sin. Sin took the law And it takes the opportunity, and what happens is sin is invigorated by the law. Don't do this. Don't do that. And Paul says, it said, don't covet. And it started producing coveting of me of every sort. The the law just stimulates and stirs up sin. It has no power. It was an aider and a better to sin. The Mosaic system did not grant life and power and salvation, but it brought sin and death and transgression. So hear this. The law is not sin's slayer, but rather it's empowerment. Go live under law and it just empowers sin and stirs it up and provokes it and invigorates it. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. The law gives power to sin. The the old era, the law was powerless over sin and in the new era, grace gives you power from on high in our battle against sin. There can be no liberation from sin without a liberation from being under the law. The law is weak and helpless. Nothing but being under grace can trump the power of sin. And so hear this, the assurance of our victory in this holy war is not based on our assurance of pardon but on the power of grace in God over sin. I will be victorious because of God's power and purpose. That gives me goosebumps. And what is his purpose? Listen, here's the whole Romans. Justification. The law cannot justify you. Grace can justify you before God and make you acceptable and stand in his presence blameless with great joy. And sanctification, the law cannot break sin's dominion, but grace breaks its dominion and will sustain you from ever going back under its tyranny. The law could not bring you home. The wages of sin is death and it would have brought you to eternal condemnation. But I want you to hear this. Grace will bring you home safely. My hope isn't in me. My hope is that I'm under grace. That's the whole argument of this section. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Height or depth, the devil, death, and please listen to me, not even sin. Did you hear that? Not even sin can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. To be under grace is to be under the rule and the realm and the resources of Almighty God. God's grace guarantees, verse 12, that sin will not have dominion over you. And God's grace guarantees that you can give your members to serve God and not sin. God will not forsake us. He who began a good work will complete it. My friends, we shall one day stand in his presence blameless with great joy shining like the noonday sun in Christ's conformity because of grace, God's purpose and God's power. All glory be to God. John Bunyan said to run and work the law commands, but gives us neither feet nor hands. But better news the gospel brings, it bids us fly and it gives us wings to obey our God. And so I pray, my, the grace of God, by faith in Christ, you're not under law, but you're under grace. So whether you have weak faith, struggling faith, 
doubting faith, lack of assurance tonight. Don't be in awe of the battle, but be in awe of the grace that holds and helps you in this battle and, and will bring you home safely because the name of God is at stake. Wait on the Lord. And so we stand in grace. To God be the glory that sin shall not have dominion over us. For we are not under law, but under grace. Amen? I love that it's an indicative. Man, that's a promise. That gives wings to our Christian life. And so I pray that we would learn and be encouraged by this beautiful grace that we're under. And, and we would expect that God will change and give victory and transform and keep us and hold us. I, I want us to live with great certainty in the grace of God, not in my law keeping. And I, I pray if you're here tonight or you're sitting at home on Sunday, I want you to see that grace um, can utterly save you to the uttermost. It can make you right with God. It can take away the condemnation for your sin. And it can break the power that is ruling and reigning your life. And it will bring you safe to the presence of God to bask in the new heavens and the new earth forever. All glory be to God. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for this beautiful passage. My heart has been so encouraged and uplifted. I feel so strengthened. And I feel so confident in you. And I love that I'm no longer under law. I can't bring myself back under it. I can't buy its lies and, and try to serve it and, and give it perfect obedience so that you'll smile at me. I can't look to it to empower me to quit sinning, to keep rubbing up against Moses and the tablets of stone saying, grow me, sanctify me. There's no power in tablets. Oh God, thank you for joining us to Jesus Christ. Grace incarnate and the power that flows by your spirit through being joined to Jesus Christ to change us from one image of glory to the next, that now we can fulfill the requirements of the law. Oh God, by this gospel and your power, we can love you with our heart, mind, soul, and strength and our neighbor as ourself. I pray, teach us how to walk in the spirit. Teach us how to be changed and transformed and live the way Jesus lived upon this earth. God, our world is crying for those kind of men, women, and children. I pray for this promise tonight. Sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law any longer, but you are under the grace of God. Oh, that makes me want to give my members to serve the King of Kings and no longer serve the Diabolos. Oh God, I thank you for this glorious transaction of grace. Thank you for taking us out from under law and bringing us to be under grace. And I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.